Welcome to the What's the Headline podcast. I am Jake Payne, Editor-in-Chief of Ambrosia for Heads, and this is Reggie Williams, our founder and CEO. And we've been talking to Mayhem, too, before you join, man, about just like, you know, paying dues and, and the road that you guys have taken to get here. Right. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've become a producer that obviously people seek out by name after years of paying dues. Sure. Was there a particular beat or project where you felt like, okay, I've arrived, like things have changed? Um, I feel like right about when um, West did uh, Hitler 2, I had a, 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 you know, a handful of beats on there. I felt like that one was the one that kind of caught on and kind of just got us in the conversation and was a project that people really fucked with at the time. Um, yeah, I'd say that joint for sure. West definitely, you had some bangers on there for sure. Yeah. That one was good. So, I feel like it was definitely the one. And then obviously Fly God, but I feel like Hitler too was definitely the one that caught on with a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, most of your, your beats are reserved for your crew, Griselda. What makes you decide when you decide when you want to work with an MC outside of the crew? Um, well, I've always been a fan of what um, May and Action had going on out here, body and ever, just the whole the whole team. And I have been tapping in and been watching them on television for quite some time before. So it was, you know, definitely on my list of people that I wanted to work with. And off, I made off, it. Off rip. I made the list. <laughs> Real. So I was waiting patiently, you know, until we, we caught on and we got to meet everybody. And I was like, that shit. And so what's your process? Do you have beats like in the tuck or do you get together and kind of like, you know, feel a person out and like kind of craft it toward them? What, what's the process? Yeah, like at the, I mean, for instance, for, for the album, I feel like we had like a few things to start. And then we kind of just started putting the pieces together and kind of figuring out the puzzle once we started cooking. And we had those like first few bangers it was like oh all right okay we see where this is going yeah because the first yep. three we did in this crib in buffalo yep. like right. i said i happened to be there. i was there for a show right right the infamous place yeah the Halloween. We and we just knocked out literally just three joints casually right. just you know that, that was the start i think yo if i recall i think it was um it was chicken chinese yeah um broken rubber bands, broken rubber bands and what was the what was the third Oh, the one, I think the joint with, with Hologram, but it was just my verse at the time. Really? We started on that one? I, I think so. Maybe it. not, though. Yeah. Huh? yeah. yeah. Right. But or those two, yeah, three, man. And this was over the course, like, Mayhem, you said something before Derringer joined. Like, this was this was years ago that it began? Yeah, it took years. Like I said, we did, we did like, three joints. Then again, like I said, we, we were filming, doing the TV thing, so I was right. gone for almost a year. Then Griselda was blowing up. He was right. going to it, and then we would just lock in whenever we got a chance, chip right. away, knock out another two, three joints, and yeah. now we're here. And then COVID hit. hit. Right. We we were gonna put it out literally right before COVID, and then we're like, oh, we're gonna wait till this flu passes in three weeks. Then it was like three months. Then it was like one yeah. year. So then we just started. We added like another song or two, swapped some things out, and um, kept it going. You know, but like I said, the outcome is is beautiful. It's crazy, too, because, I mean, all four of us are clearly hip-hop heads, and you look at your Ready to Dies, your Illmatics, and those albums weren't made in one clip. They were made, like you were saying, of, like, three here, two here, three here, and it's crazy to me because this body of work sounds super cohesive like that. It shows you years don't change things. Uh, appreciate That's it. love, yeah. No, I'm blessed for sure. I'm going to tell you, though. Even put in the conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I've seen people literally put this project in conversations with those two, and even my mind is blown. I'll be like, nah, that's great, but don't say that. But, right, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just glad to keep working. I really like the marriage of your flow, you know, Mayhem, and, and kind of the pocket that you create, Derringer. And I told Mayhem before you jumped in the car, like, I think I think that Red Pesto in particular just, um, just shows that. You know, um, Talk to me about that one. I know, Mayhem, you said that was one of the ones that you weren't, you know, it was kind of at the end, right? Yeah, towards, yeah. yeah, because we were actually trying to figure out what joint to put Conway on, because Conway was there from the jump. Like, even if you hear he has ad-libs on different records, like, he was rocking with us. Like, he's doing right. what, what, he's doing ad-libs on what? On um, Eric B. On, Eric B., on the Eric B. remix and the end of Trigger Point, and, like, 
he was present and we like figuring out what joint to put him on. And then after it took so long, we were like, yo, let's just do a fresh one. So that was actually one of the last ones and I'm glad it was. Yeah. So y'all said this was before, a lot of it was created before COVID, but it sounds timeless. You know, uh, that's the beautiful thing about it. So how do you craft a, a timeless sounding record? I'm still trying to figure it out too, because you know it's something that we we started back then, and you know I guess with with the amount of time that passes, you never know. But I feel like just the overall vibe that we created for it, it stood up. I sure. tell you, like I just try to like make timeless things in general. I try to be as timeless as possible, just in my life. I try not to jump too into fads of what's now, what's this. Like even in terms of my name, right? Like. It's going to sound funny, but, like, Mayhem Loren, like, I took that from Ralph Loren. And it, 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 it's kind of like Ralph Loren is timeless. Like, you could wear polo in 92 and look good. You could wear polo now. Now, there were a bunch of brands and things that came in between, but they weren't timeless. Like, Ralph Loren may not be number one. Like, right now, I guess there's whatever, whatever Balenciaga, this, that, and the third. But Ralph is always in the conversation, and that's kind of try to – how I try to make myself like what he did with his fashion is what I try to do musically. I know it sounds like bugged out or, or a stretch, but that's just something I always try to do. And I think of like certain albums I love, right? Like, and I don't want to imitate them, but I want to take like, like, you know, like certain things that like you love them, but they've aged. But like the war report sounds timeless. Like Wu-Tang forever sounds timeless. Like sonically, like it sounds like those things could have came out yesterday. So, those are like the blue hell on earth. Those are like blueprints for what I do. You know, it's not just beats of the time or slang of the time. It's like, nah, I'm trying to make this forever shit, you know? Yeah. And Darren Joe's the best person to do it with. Mm. Yeah. You know, so Darren Joe, you know, listening to your productions, it's clear that your your knowledge of music is extensive. How do you, what's your process for finding samples? Because like you, you pull out sounds that I've never heard before. And that's definitely always something I've been um, heavy on, too, especially with the amount of, you know, public information with all the music that you could get now. It's, it's good to just dig a little bit deeper and find some stuff that, you know, is sounds familiar, but is still new at the same time. So I've definitely always been big on that and um, always buying records still, getting inspiration from that at the end of the day. So that's really where it's coming from. Mm. Always, you know, always listening. You know, he has carpal tunnel from carrying records. His little hands are broken. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just making that up. But now he's, he's always still buying records. So. Yeah, that's <laughs> always been a big piece of it. You know, of course, through the you always find fire on online now because it's kind of hard to avoid it. It's, it's everywhere now. But still, like, just going to the stores and actually like doing the homework and still hunting it down has always been a big thing of mine. So. Is there a particular genre you lock into, like jazz or, or like you just like, all over? It's always like all over now. Yeah, it's definitely like a few, always jazz and the, you know, the subgenres of it, always rock music, always soul, you know what I mean? So it's like once you start collecting all the genres, it starts getting crazy. Mm. You know, I'm curious to ask you, Derringer, like, you know, I know like Mayhem told us a moment ago, it was Alchemist that, you know, introduced him to your production many years ago. Um, and obviously, you know, people make their comparisons, I think, generally, generationally of, you know, discovering you over the last, you know, five to 10 years and comparing you against guys that came 10, 20, so forth sure. years before you. I'm curious to ask you, like, who, who are your North stars? I, I'm sure that Alchemist is the one that a lot of critics and fans funny. point out. But who else really led you to go down this path? I mean, it was it was plenty, but it was very heavy, you know, premiere. Pete, Large, Rizza, of course, um, Alchemist, of course. Man, there were so many. Mm -hmm. And then just being into it's just crazy once we start getting down to it, down to like beat miners and, you know, tip and have and just the whole mob deep shit. And man, it's so crazy once we start. I know I'm forgetting a few. DITC, of course, it was really all over the place. Like everybody listened to that shit for a while. It, definitely sunk in and it was like yeah this is what i want to do mm -hmm. and it was kind of crazy because the family background too is like a lot of people think that that's what i was really trying to do but a lot of those beats that i started making with my father being a pianist i started going through the records at home and finding that i had a lot of that similar type of thing so naturally when i started making those type of beats it was kind of similar 
We needed your father to play Broken Rubber Bands. For real. <laughs> that would have been legendary. Word. Shout out to him. What well, kind of music? Broken Rubber Bands, yeah, too. Some, some background. What kind of music was he playing in the house? Jazz. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So jazz yeah. piano and like, you know, a lot of Herbie Hancock and just like a lot of random jazz, Bill Blue Note stuff and Groove Merchant. Just a lot of stuff for me to go through uh, and start, you know, figuring out what I liked. And so yeah. Together. It's kind of crazy. So y'all are in Queens now, right? And Mayhem, you rap Queens, you know, hard on the album and, you know, just generally. So we talked about AZ earlier, but who are some of your favorite uh, Queens MCs? Oh, man, like, shit, it's, they, they, they're so many, man. You got to right. just want to go through Queensbridge in general. You could just knock out, like, Nas, Nature, Mob Deep, Capone, right. Nori, Nor, you know, Nori's from Left Right, but it's like that, that's just... Alone, I mean, then, then you got, I mean, I love everything from Queens. I know 50, I mean, 50, e even the first Lost Boys album is one of my favorite albums ever, man. You got Tribe. There's just so much. G-Rap, G-Rap's probably my favorite rapper of all time. I mean, just Queens is endless. Shout out Royal Flush, man. Like, like there's so many sleepers from Queens, you know what I mean? It just made great things. LL Cool J, I mean, legend, like, there's so many people from Queens that I forgot, maybe the biggest person from Queens, like, I just added LL, because that's that's how oversaturated Queens mm. is, which is L shit, you know what I mean? So it's just a great place to um, grow up and soak up and just, you know, a lot of people from there to look up to, you know? Yeah, Ron and D, yeah, for sure. So, you know, people talk about, you know, Brooklyn swagger and, like, or Brooklyn's attitude and Harlem swagger, but what makes an MC distinctly Queens? You know, um, I don't know. Like, it's just, you just, you just know. It's just a, I think they're real descriptive. I think we're good at painting pictures in Queens. You know, I think Brooklyn is really good with some, um, like you said, swag, punchlines, et cetera, et cetera. But like Queens is like, there's a lot of rappers from Queens that, for example, there's rappers that may not be the greatest rapper, but you feel them so much as a personality that's like you could see through their eyes, which is a gift in its own. Where it's like they may not be super rapidy rap or have the best um poetic ability, but it's just it's just real. It's just real visual. I, I guess to answer the question, I'll say it's visual. Like anytime a Queens rapper is, is speaking, you see what they're saying. If that makes any sense, you know? Yeah. Makes, makes perfect sense because one of the things that I think about this album in particular is like the lyrics are cinematic. And I think the music is too, Derringer. I mean, you complement it a lot of times. I think your sounds feel like they're out of 70s or 80s, like film or TV scores, you know, like, you know, that, that you know, we've seen time and time again. I'm curious to ask you, Mayhem, like, you know, being so cinematic, given what you just said about the Queen's imagery, um, I look at a song like Valedictorians, which kind of feels like a coming to age in the chorus, you know, you know, learning, learning fast. Um, is there a film or a piece of visual media that really resonates like with your upbringing that you can point to and say, yeah, that's me? No, I have just not, 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 not just one, to be honest, it's a bunch of things. If you were to piece together maybe nine and a half movies and <laughs> six screenplays and one cartoon, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But like, nah, I, I can't think of one exactly, but that's tough, you know? What, so, yeah, yeah, so Darren, I got a question for you. Um, you know, a lot of hip hop's greatest labels are built around a, a producer or a crew of producers. You know, Death Row, No Limit, Cash Money, TDE, Bad Boy. Right. Which are some of your favorites and what have you learned from them in building Griselda? Definitely everybody that you have just mentioned, for sure. Um, man, start thinking about it. It's actually, it's kind of kind of crazy, right? Yeah. But yeah, definitely everybody that you had mentioned. Um, just trying to think off top. What else are we missing that you just, that you had named? Um, yeah. Man. Yo, I got to go back. I'm sorry. Back to the Queen's question. Yeah. And I don't know how I, that's what I'm telling you. There's just, exactly. there's just so many people right. from Queens that you ask that question, you're going to forget someone like, or, yeah, so. And especially for producers still too, I'm thinking on and on and I definitely missed a few, few yeah. people myself. 
Shit. Yeah. Mad Lib, of course. I didn't mention Mad Lib and Shout Dilla and, 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 and High Tech at the time, too. Like, all that stuff had, like, I was listening to all of that shit. So, that really just, like, fucking with all the different producers definitely. And what what did you learn from stuff. them in building Griselda? Um, It was really once me and Wes locked in and we just, you know, I seen exactly what the vision was and what the sound needed to be. It was definitely like, okay, okay lock in mode, and this is what we need to do. I felt like we started just doing it. And then, man, once I know Wes was just started laying a lot of this down on, and then Conway came, and then all the pieces just started getting put together. And then Benny coming around after everything, like, yeah, it's, it's crazy to see where it is now. And everything that we did to get to this point for sure it's it's a blessing for sure i love it Listen, i'm yeah. from 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 a fan all like from, all being from the same, yeah, on, the same on, on the outside though just watching that sure. whole thing grow and blow was yeah. it's amazing because i knew from early like yo i fuck with these dudes but to see where they took it man i'm just right. couldn't be happier for real for sure especially all of us coming from the, from the city um most uh, of the times like the producer lived outside of the city maybe when the groups were put together and or so for everybody to be from the city and do it collectively, I feel like it's a big thing too, for mm. sure. It's like How would you describe your sound and vision? I mean, probably fucking ridiculous to say, but sick and crazy for sure. Definitely something wrong with me at the end of the day for me to be choosing these particular sounds and, and uh, <laughs> putting drums on them yeah. and making these fails, but yeah, shit, it's, it's. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, he has a, he, I'm not going to lie. He, he has a devious sound. Like <laughs> I, I have a similar subject matter in general, yeah. but with Derringer, I feel like when I hear Derringer beats, there's only one thing I can rap about and it's nothing sure. good, bro. Like <laughs> it's just, I, that's just what it is. Yeah. Sinister. There is, a, there is a lighter side though. Yeah. There is a lighter side. I will say that. So I got it, you know, particularly the ones that get picked are like more of the grimy type of field shit. Maybe I'm sick. Maybe I'm the one who picks the yeah. evil. I skip the flute samples and pick the evil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With all the music, it's just, it, it varies. But yeah, it's, it's dope that, you know, when just a particular thing seems to work. Have, so has you, them out. Has you, you know, coming from that musical background with your father, have how have you had a chance to watch him react to your success? Um, not so much. I, I still think he's trying to understand what's going on. He's not really sure. It's still, he's like one bar loop, two bar loop. You know, he's quite not understanding the simplicity aspect of it, really. So that's cool. But as far as like, you know, like picking and picking the samples out and finding the parts and putting it together, you know, definitely mm -hmm. appreciates that for sure. Definitely got to have it here to do it. So absolutely. Um, so, you know, Mayhem, on the album, you reference uh, Brennan and Carr on Trigger Point Therapy, um, which has been a spot, you know, you mentioned the TV. That's been a spot I've been trying to check out next time I'm in the city for a while. Both of you guys are on your way to dinner right now. Um, you know, and this album comes out on Black Truffle Enterprises. Do you see yourself getting more into, like, the food and hospitality game as an owner, as a chef, as, you know, something... I mean there's not immediate plans, but a thousand percent. I mean, I, the love I have for food is the same love I have for music. You know what I mean? And, and if we're going to be quite frank, there's probably more longevity in food than music. Mm. So I definitely want to head in that direction. I don't know if I'm going to come out first with a spice line, if I'm going to actually open a restaurant. I've been in talks about a bunch of things, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to have my, my, you know, self-involved in the food world. I'm just figuring out the best lane to start with because you got to start strong and then grow. Yeah. So I don't want to make the wrong move and then figure it out, you know? Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed, you know, you, the stuff you do with Vice. Um, you know, I, I really, I, I hope to see more of that content from you because you, wherever you were, you made it look real and authentic and that's just like your music. Yeah, I mean, it was. We, we just were literally just enjoying life and um, a, lot of, a lot of those moments are so great because we're literally experiencing things for the first time. It wasn't like, oh, this is my 10th trip to Morocco. Let me pretend to act surprised. Like, nah, dog, this is the first day here. And there's a camera in our face catching all of that. So, you know, that, that was amazing. 
Right. So, so we that, talked about uh, this a bit off camera, uh, but you know, one of the lines that jumped at me was million dollar conversations. And that's a powerful line and like paints a picture, but can you describe for the people, you don't have to get into the specifics obviously, but what the types of conversations that are million dollar conversations. You talked about looking forward in the future and obviously you're thinking about building enterprises. So can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I'll be honest, man. Um, any, any, any conversation that's a lucrative conversation and you're bu building with someone who wants to be consistent can be a million dollar conversation. Literally every conversation about making money has potential to grow to a million dollar combo. So whether you're talking about doing a project and then it turns into a series of projects that's a million dollars or whether you want to sell sandwiches and eventually open restaurants, like whatever it is, you want to be a re they, anything you put your mind to and literally are consistent with can become a million dollar convo. So I was basically just saying, um, just having com having positive convos, not really sitting gossiping and talking about bullshit. When you're sitting down talking about building, it all has the potential to reach the sky. So that's what I'm saying, like non-specifically, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, Derringer, I remember it was about 20 years ago when critics and fans, everybody was like pestering Ninth Wonder and Kanye West, Just Blaze about soul sampling. Like right. the questions about that, you know, had an effect on their sound. I think they each one of them moved past it in a way. And I see a lot of discussion online. People are always talking about drums and, and beats with no drums and this and that. And one thing I will say is Black Vladimir, like I said, phenomenal marriage. Of, of pockets and flows. I love the drumming on this album, but is there a question like that that gets tiring for you and all of your kind of evolution over the last five, 10? Absolutely. And we were just talking about this too. It's just really that there's no rules to it at the end of the day. You know, it's like no rule to how to make a beat at the end of the day. And then the whole no drums thing is like, you know, it's a whole nother conversation too, because a lot of times there's drums in the music. It's just, you know, is it in the forefront or is it behind or is it in the middle? You know, there's ways to ways to do it. So it, uh, it's all preference at the end of the day, too. But um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm curious to ask you too. Best. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. What'd you say there? No, I was just saying like whatever is the best feel at the end of the day. Sometimes it doesn't need to be so in the forefront, you know, yeah. or on top of it. Whereas you know, maybe at the time, a lot of the records that were inspired by the drums were in the forefront at that time more so. That was like the thing so whereas now maybe the music's in the forefront and the drums are more background things so mm -hmm. it just feel at the end of the day if it feels good you don't have to really do you know do all that and then you guys are talking about the soul music too it's it's it gets tricky messing with soul music and adding drums over the rhythms that are already great in those records so you know you've done a really interesting thing in that you've created a lane for yourself but you've put on a lot of other folks you know on production and we're seeing that more and more on griselda projects obviously this one is all you talk to me of that challenge because on one hand i think you represent you know the 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 manifestation of a dream that a lot of guys have and, and women too but on the other like here you are like sharing the light but you're finding distinct voices to bring with you like talk to me about that challenge Right. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, it's just having the, the different styles of music and just being into all the different type of things I feel like helps when you're putting an album together. You know, when you're digging into one particular sound, maybe, you know, it's going to sound all the same or similar, which a lot of people already seem to, you know, say that about me. I see a lot, you know, they think it's just like one style of beat, but it's really, you know, different different things on everything it's not like we're reusing the same records and the same drums on every song it's really just able to do it and switch it up and still make fire hmm. yeah so a lot of projects have started off as one-offs you know uh the collaborations between producers and mcs that have grown to long-term collaborations uh so i think about ninth and mers what they've done royce and primo now Mm -hmm. Currency and Alchemist. Can you guys see making albums in the future over time? Yeah, a hundred percent. Even Absolutely. if he wakes up and hates me tomorrow, I'm <laughs> gonna shake him down and say, "We're doing part two. I know you have more. It's not about us. It's about the people." Thanks. For all you know, he could hate me right now. He could secretly be stabbing me in the ribs. The <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're gonna get the work done. Yeah. <laughs> but well, now, on a serious note, yeah, I mean. It's, 
this is my man. This is my friend. Like, honestly, more than we even do music, we just get on the phone and laugh. We, we just do a lot of laughing. And every now and then they make a song, you know what I mean? So it's like I, I see us working for, for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm forgetting names too. I gotta throw Ronda Jules in there too. I can see that too. So yeah. yeah. So Darren, you you mentioned that that you got a you know diverse more. It sounds to me like you have other things in the tuck that would be surprising to people. Like, can you talk about some of those beats? Yeah, just as more as like more melody stuff and just you know like a lot of the. I've always been into those genres as well. So naturally. A lot of the Bronson joints you did. Different yeah, than, than, than yeah, the traditional right. sounds. Like a lot of joints you done on the Bronson albums have a whole different vibe. You know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So definitely, definitely in the vault. Definitely, you know, got shit like that too. So definitely going to be, you know, something I work towards is like trying to get those other sounds out to not just be one thing or what people think I could just do, you know, one type of beat. So. Mm-hmm. It's going to be good to these next few years with everything going on. I'm, I'm excited, yeah, to see everything, you know, what happens these next few years. We definitely need to make part two. Okay. And I love to see that everybody's, you know, the whole feedback on the album, too. It's just good to know that we could, you know, cook a plate and people are talking about it, you know. You ever think about doing a themed instrumental series? Yeah, there's definitely some, um, some things I'm trying to sort out. Yeah, one now, right? yeah, um, yeah. I did the one with the Baker's Dozen with Fat Beats. That was mm-hmm. um, when I first moved to New York, so that yeah. might have been like 2018, maybe. Yeah. And then I am working on some sh- now for my platform, and that I'll be having on the website soon to share. So, mm. excellent the work. You know, yes, sir. Mayhem on Raspberry Crush, you wrap this line. You say New Balance supports Trump and Jordan supports prisons. I'm still walking both because fashion distorts vision. And to me, that's such a slick line because, you know, so many people might do something and not say what's behind it. But like you, I don't know. There's a lot to that. Can you talk to me about that line? Because I know obviously people know you from rap, from fashion, but you you, kind of say the quiet part out loud. I'm going I'm to talk to you about that line. Like, yeah, again, like you said, I said, New Balance supports Trump, Jordan supports prison. I'm still rocking both because fashion distorts vision. But I want to publicly apologize because I fucked up with that line. Mm. The Michael Jordan who invests in private prisons is not Michael Jordan who makes Jordans. <laughs> so oh. I fucked up and I apologize to Michael Jordan. Even though I said I still wear them because the point of it was I know this, but I'm still going to rock what I rock. So that was a line where at the moment I thought of something and I thought I was sharing it, but we, yo, we all make mistakes and I, I'm manning up and saying my bad about that, you know? That makes me feel better personally, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, but, 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 you know, at, at the moment, the point was like, even though we know certain things and feel certain things, we're still going to do what we want and not front about it. And that was like, yeah, just me being honest because, even if Michael Jordan did support private prisons, I still probably have one some calm on sixes feeling good that day. Cause we're all we're not perfect. So that was just yeah. me, you know, throwing something out there. But I fucked up with that line. I really did. Interesting. That's good to know. Yeah. I I don't even I'm not I've I've made it 38 years without owning a pair of Jordans. Don't ask me why. But I uh I thought that so line I was crazy. Buy you. You, were, you, were you were 12? Yeah. Okay, if you were a 12, that would be one more person trying to buy my pair so i'm glad you don't have jordan's i'm a 12 too so we all gonna be in there all right oh man <laughs> those sixes. all right so we talked about prisons and we talked about mj uh jay-z calls himself the mj of recording and has recently devoted a lot of his life to getting people out of prisons uh what did you guys think about uh the verse her around the world this past friday on god did you know, I'm gonna be so honest. I saw all the tweets, I saw the Instagram. I still haven't sat down with the God Dead album yet. I have not heard the verse, I've not heard the project. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'll probably listen to it tonight, but I've just been running around, I have some personal things going on. I've been celebrating Vladimir, I've just been staring in the mirror, popping bottles of champagne with my album on repeat. But I will get to it, and I'm sure it's great because Hove is great, you know. But I ain't hear it yet, I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Dad, you hear it? Hove went crazy. Hove. Hove. 
know what Pope's going to do every time, you know? He just keeps getting better and better. Yeah. So, um, Effortless. What MCs do you want to work with that you haven't worked with yet? As for both of y'all. Yeah. This is uh, extensive, right? Like, I mean, bucket list and or. Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's go bucket list. Mm -hmm. Let's go bucket list. I mean, we just said here, I definitely you know, got to do the train with Hope. Trying with Nas still at the end of the day. It's definitely, man, quite a few. I'll, I'll be honest, you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to do a locks record, like all three mm. of them. Mm. I'd love to do an MOP record, mm. both Billy Fame and myself. And I'd love to do a firm record with mm. all members of the firm. I'd love to do a joint with Nas, Mega, AZ, Foxy, and Nature. Like, mm. fuck it. Like that that would be just a crazy Queens bucket list. Right. Not even Queens, because you know Foxy and A was from Brooklyn, but yeah, yeah that, that 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 would be fine to me. Any of those three, I I could die a happy man, mm. but I still want to come back to life because I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you guys have a song on the album "Airplane Mode," and it's about distancing your distancing yourself from others. And I'm curious, you know, for both of you, um, what's been the secret sauce that's made you stand the test of time when we all know that hip hop is so saturated? For that, oh, I, I don't want to keep stealing all the questions. Man. <laughs> now, I, I'll say for me, really, just um, you know, um, authenticity and uh, and protecting your brand and like literally putting your all into everything. And sometimes you have to turn things down. Sometimes saying no. Sometimes all money isn't good money, and sometimes all situations aren't good because. You could, you know, I know a lot of artists, right? That I see, like some of my favorite artists, they run around, they literally do every feature, snatch yeah. every penny. Right. And then when it comes to their albums, they drain. So it's like, yeah, you made bread at the time, but now you tapped out when it's time to create your plate. So I try to like, don't even do other things until I'm finished with what I'm working on at the time, because I need to put all my best energy into I don't know if I have the answer, but yeah, preserving your best for yourself, you know? I agree, I agree. Yeah, I mean, with that said, I mean, you guys, you know, I don't, we don't know each other like that, but you guys both seem like really, you know, well-liked. I know you're active in the, you know, hip-hop community. How do you say no? Like, how do you say no in a way that keeps the doors open, but also protects your brand, like you just said, Mayhem? Oh, I mean, I just, I, I just be honest. I don't say no, hell no, get out of here. But I'll be like, yo, I'm in the middle of this project. I got to knock this out and then we can revisit it. And, right. you know, often I do and I'll, I'll get done what I have to get done. Or a lot of times when you do that, you know, everyone has their own deadline. So sometimes by the time you're ready, right. they've already put out what they're putting out. But I don't say no just to say no, but I do keep the focus on the main things that I'm working on and like my legacy and what I'm going to leave behind. You know, like I said, I can't, give my best verses to the whole world. And then I'm stumped when I'm in the middle of my next LP. That's, I, I've been there before too. This is not, I didn't just wake up and have all the answers. I've made mistakes and, and then I've learned from them. There's times I, I ran around doing a bunch of shit with everybody else. And then I was not my best on my projects. And then I'm like, whoa, I'm never doing this again. Or I'm gonna get my, my works, bodies of work done and then do the other things, you know? Yeah. So, you know, Derringer, West Side Gun puts out a lot of music every year. Conway puts out a lot of music every year. Benny puts out a lot of music every year. Boldy puts out a lot of music. Like, how are you so pro prolific? How are you able to create so much quality in, uh, in such a short amount of time? Pressure is definitely, definitely there for sure. I feel like when everything is going on, you really have to make the best of your time that way if you don't you're definitely going to be left out because mm. there's definitely a few you know a lot of new heads that are coming in and making fire too so and that's good because it's tough to do everything yourself at the end of the day it's not impossible so the fact that there's a lot of homies stepping up and making heat right now are definitely making it you know not even competition but just ins inspirational to go back and, and just try to find the right thing and just really always be on it no excuses yeah. 
steel sharp and steel. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, on that note, it's something I learned about business recently, right? Like, instead of being in competition, you better off growing the business. And, and like our business, like let's say it's a certain type of rap. It's a certain type of hip hop. So instead of other dudes coming with dope shit or shit comparable to yours, instead of hating on them, you want them to blow. Right. So that just makes the whole thing bigger. You get what I'm saying? But people don't see that. They want to think, oh, he's doing this type of rap. This is my competition. This is my enemy. Like, no, he's not. It's like Coke needs Pepsi. Mm. You know what I'm saying? McDonald's needs Burger King. Like, it just helps make burgers bigger. It makes soda bigger. So when we doing a certain type of rap, when someone comes out the blue making ill shit, you want to salute them and hope they blow because that's just going to make the whole culture bigger. Like, that's what I told you before I met Derringer and Gun Benny Conway. I viewed us as being on the same team before I met them. I really did. So people need to really use that mind frame and understand that it just makes it all bigger. Mm. I was fans of them before before we were known for anything as well. So they all, they all came together. So some people make music for the radio. Some people make it for the streets. Some people make it for the cars, some for the clubs. What do you guys make your music for? So, you know, all, the, all the three that you just mentioned. I know, you know, the, the club might not be uh, on the list of things that, you know, we get a, a bunch of play in, but shit, they still definitely playing shit. Here <laughs> of course, there, yeah. of course, so, yeah. You may think it's not, but yeah, there's, there's shit. And different you know? clubs, different places. Exactly. Like, I, I, out of country right right now, somebody's in, right. in, in Eastern Europe doing the running man, yeah, the Black know. Vladimir, drinking <laughs> vodka, you know what I'm saying? Like, want to cover all the bases, too. Man. Yeah. It's important. And, and there's one thing you left out, like there is the clubs, there's the cars, but also like the stage, man. A lot mm. of that I've had the, the privilege to tour numerous times and do a lot of shows, like a lot of songs I write from a performance perspective now, mm. especially hooks. Like my verses might always be just from the heart of, you know, from my mind. But like, for example, like the joint that you love, um, Red Pesto, I wrote that hook and I imagine performing that. That's like a mm. performance hook. Like mm. I could see the whole crowd with me on that like you know what i mean so that's just another perspective we make music for also and it's gotta yeah, feel good that. yeah after the pandemic to be able to touch stages again it has to feel different at least on on the level that you're used to yeah no i sure wait and i'll tell you what doing all the shows and being on the road and, and seeing the stage and the and the crowd participation for songs now it kind of changed the way that I make beats. I think differently now when I hear certain things and certain tempos now because of just doing the shows and, and seeing, you know, how certain things work now and how certain tempos and certain bops work for the show. A couple BPMs faster ends up working out. Sometimes the slower ones up, end up working out, but it's just... Yeah, you can't call yeah, it Yeah, you can't call it. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting to hear. You know, Derringer, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to ask you, like, you know, you look at RZA, who's still well into Wu-Tang success, was making those pre-productions, you know, in the basement before it flooded. And you mentioned, you know, moving to, moving across the state in 2018. Was there part of you that, you know, felt like, yo, maybe I should stay to not challenge the sound or did you embrace it, you know, like open arms, like this is what I need to be doing for my career. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, because it definitely took me out of my comfort zone. So it was challenging for sure. And, um, and to do it in a smaller space and yeah, to not just be at home with all my surroundings that I was used to when I created a lot of those first records. So um, kind of almost felt like starting from scratch almost, but um, yeah, because it's different when you start producing and you have all your music with you all the time, you know, you end up, you know, finding certain things you wouldn't you wouldn't find if, if you just have like a couple crates at home or something, you know, so being able to relocate and then start building again from from the top. Really, I feel like it was challenging, but yeah, mm -hmm. I feel like we on it. I feel like it's happening. Yeah, it happened for sure. So I feel you kept the sound too. Like I said, yeah, from my outside yeah, yeah, perspective, I feel the Darren just shit I heard from Buffalo that I love is the right. same as the beats he's making in New right. York. You know, aesthetic's still the same. New York City, yeah, it's all yeah. New York. And especially moving to New York too, and having the access to the music out here, definitely, you know, I knew what I was gonna do when I got here for sure. Yeah, I didn't even know that you had made that transition until you said it. So that just speaks to your point, Mayhem, of like, yo, it's all cohesive, consistent. 
Right. Yeah, because we're not changing the formula at all. We're still coming at it with the same ear mm-hmm. and just, you know, getting sharper. So, Mayhem, you've been doing this for 13, 14 years. Darren, I know you've been doing it for a minute, too. What keeps you guys motivated? All the heat that's coming out, you know, hearing, hearing fire and just still being inspired by, you know, by our peers, for sure. Yeah. I would just say life, man. Life, life, yeah, life, life for, for me, sure. just, if you're an artist, man, like, like what I tell people is, especially with my art, like, I absorb things. It's like you're a sponge. You absorb life and then you give it back through your music. So it's right. like, one thing about that is you keep living and whether things take a positive turn or negative turn, you're still going to make music out of that, you know? Nice. If you take a loss, if someone passes away, it's going to be reflected in your music. If you a bag of money lands on you or you end up on TV, it's going to be reflected in your music. Like, whatever's happened to me in life, positive or negative, has helped me make better music. At the end, I make it a positive. So as long as I'm living... I'm going to keep making, you know, interesting mm. things. That's how I, how I feel about it. Mm. So sounds like y'all got that there are more projects we can expect from you guys over the years. We talked a little bit about being on the road, but do y'all have plans to go on the road with this album? Oh, 100 percent. 100 percent. Some things are getting lined up now. It's like even if we didn't want to, how can we deny the people? This is what they want. This is what they love. Absolutely. You know? We can't right wait. Now this, you know? Neighbors are wondering why their neighbors are screaming Black Vladimir and punching the wall. Like, we're driving, we're driving the world crazy right now. Yeah. But like I said, I didn't even tell you, but, but on the way here, at gave me the call that I'm going to do those next 10 dates, chill too. So That's we're going cool. on the road now, and uh, I'm Black only Vladimir. performing Black Vladimir. You know, I might give them one or two old songs, but right now it's Vladimir season. The Vladimir agenda. Yo, by the way, Vladimir has nothing to do with Vladimir Putin. I've no, had a few people all. message me yeah. and question me and say, why would you want to honor a, a, a war crime person, etc." cetera? Say, dog, we had this name for four or five years. Vladimir, that was a nickname that I had. There was a story where I once lied to somebody and told them my name was Vladimir and I was an architect from New Jersey. And my friends found it so funny that they would just call me Black Vladimir because it's like, yo, what do you mean? They believed your name was Vladimir and why Why an architect from Jersey? It was just like, it was an inside joke and we just titled the album that, like, not knowing that Russia was going to flip the switch two weeks before the album drops yeah. and then everyone's looking at us like, this is what we're trying to honor. It has nothing to do with that, man. Nothing. At all. That's nothing. hilarious. I'm glad you cleared that up because I just assumed I wasn't even going to ask. All right, nah. that's dope. Oh, that's dope. Nah, yeah. man. Hell I'm no. sitting there like vodka, Vladdy Divac. Yeah, now, <laughs> now we learn that's your Art Vandalay. That's your, that's your Seinfeld name. Exactly. Exactly. That's what it was. <laughs> exactly. Yo, well, we know you guys are on your way to dinner. We appreciate y'all talking with us and talking with the people. Anything else you got, got to say to the people? Bob Black Vladimir, man. We got, we got the vinyls, the, the, the CDs, um, cassettes, a whole bunch of merch coming exclusively on mayhemloren.com. And um, I think we're going to be live this Friday, but regardless, sign up. There's a mailing list and make sure you get those limited editions and enjoy it, you know? Dope. And I, I definitely want to catch y'all when y'all come to New York, for sure. 100%. All right. Yeah. Cool. Appreciate y'all. Yeah, thank, thank, you. Y'all. thank you. Thank you for all the support. Appreciate Word. it. Yeah. Been All a right. fan of y'all for a while too, so this was overdue. Word for sure. Thank you. All right, Thank you, bro. Peace, y'all. Right, y'all. Peace. <laughs>